The UK events industry has been through a tough time. Many businesses have been scaled back or been forced to stop operating, meaning a fight for survival. However, event professionals are also renowned for their creativity and resourcefulness. In this series of videos, I shall be meeting some of them and hearing their stories. Hopefully their experiences will comfort and inspire others. Today we're meeting Milan Thakra, who is a key part of the commercial events business at historic royal palaces. HLP's unique portfolio of six venues boasts centuries of history and provides event clients with a rare opportunity to follow in the footsteps of royalty. Tell me about historic royal palaces. So historic royal palaces is an independent charity um, and we look after and care for six royal palaces. Um, those being the Tower of London, Hampton Court Palace, Banqueting House, Kensington Palace, Kew Palace and Hillsborough Castle in Northern Ireland. Pre-Covid um, we were hosting up to 500 plus events. We were a team of 40 um, across all of our sites and you know we were on scheduled to have our best ever year um, in 2020. When did you first realise that Covid would have an impact on the HRP business? It was in mid-February. Me and my colleague were away actually on business, um, promoting the palaces for events. Um, when we discovered um, that Covid was going to have a huge impact, um, we quickly identified that clients had started to shift their focus on, on when they were hosting their events and it sort of almost the domino effect of um, cancellations, postponements began mid-Feb into early March. I mean, is that because some of your business is overseas? You know, was it domestic clients with the uncertainty? Because obviously COVID felt like an overseas problem at first. Absolutely. It, it, with Historic Royal Palaces, we are an iconic collection of venues. The incentive market is huge for us. Um, so overseas travel, both corporate, but also um, private families, um, having private experiences, private parties. Um, so it's a huge part of our business. And so there was certainly a concern. Um, and that started with the venue, because that's often the first port of call when you are planning an event. What changed for HRP once uh, COVID started to have an impact? We had to become agile in the way we operate, both internally and externally. Internally, we, um, you know, as a team, were having to support one another. We were picking up tasks um, and carrying out tasks that were out of our comfort zone, out of our usual remit um, to inquiries to managing postponements, cancellations. Um, externally, we were having to adapt our products. We are venues, we are bricks and mortar, and that's what we sell, and that is our product. However, we were having to adapt what that looks like, whether it is micro events, micro weddings, corporate events that were virtual. Um, so we had to adapt our product, um, and we quickly did that to meet consumer needs um, and across the summer we adapted our COVID safe operational um, uh, requirements, our risk assessments um, and delivered. We were fortunate to deliver um, a number of events, uh, micro weddings, um, you know, conferences and large scale outdoor events with our event partners. We were able to quickly maneuver our um, operations and with sites like ours the operational element is vast um, there's lots of intricacies but as an organization we were able to shift our focus on where we found commercial opportunities people wanted outdoor experiences because they were not able to travel at all or go on holiday let's utilize the beauty of our palaces so we created products that were high-end exclusive within a beautiful setting so we were flexible and adapted our current existing products to work within the restrictions we had. 
And also that meant from a price point of view, we were all very aware that normal venue hires weren't quite applicable at that point. So we adapted our, our rates and our fees um, to reflect that. Um, and we also made, again, for us, it's the ease of, for the client. So we ensured that the, the operational elements and the costs of it were all bought together with its with suppliers, our venue fees, tour guides, etc. You know, that planning element we made sort of a lot smoother for clients um, just to ensure that they, they felt it was very easy for, to book. You said you were doing things outside your comfort zone. Can you just say a little bit more about what that was? We have a team of 40 and a majority of those team members were on furlough. So from a team of 40 down to four or five, you know, I was actually, I am a salesman. I was actually operating events. I was running events um, and, you know, small scale, but it still required me to shift my experience, my skills to something that I was not day to day normally do. So because a number of your colleagues were furloughed, you were having to pick up other jobs. Absolutely. And there was a sense of camaraderie there where you felt responsible to, again, we're a charity. So we would do everything it took to keep this charity going and these palaces running. So there was a sense of responsibility as well, regardless of how big or small or demeaning or the task, we would do it. <laughs> That's quite funny because obviously you think of a prestigious organisation and really what you're saying is you're just as humble as everybody else because you've got to like... Absolutely, we've got to, you've got to do what you've got to do to survive. And I think everyone went through that notion, especially the hospitality industry, because it was, it was hit so hard. So any event inquiry that was for the next month or for a small scale, you know, micro event, we would, we would do anything it took to deliver it because it meant, you know, that extra bit of money to keep us going that extra little bit longer. Mm. How did it influence, if at all, your relationship with your suppliers, your event partners? Events are not possible without our vendors and suppliers. And so these relationships we have, you know, often some venues, for some venues it's quite transactional. For us, we care about our suppliers and we wanted to ensure that where possible, we were able to support them, whether it's send business their way, whether it was relief in terms of any kind of financial commitments they may have had with us. Um, so it was ensuring that we were also there to advise and um, give clients the ability to connect with them quicker or often with a vast list of suppliers, um, you know, clients want that support. So we were able to give clients that support to say, actually, you should reach out to Stuart or we should reach out to this caterer or this production team because they've actually launched this product during COVID or I know that they can help you or they are working and they're running at the moment. So where possible, we wanted to, again, it's that collaboration and partnership which was key for us and continues to be key because actually those suppliers and those partnerships that we have is what is going to see us through the next six months even. Do you think COVID has given you a renewed kind of relationship, uh, you know, closeness? Absolutely, yeah. I think the industry as a whole has come together. I think where often you were quite guarded in terms of your business and the intricacies of your business, I think all suppliers are becoming more fluid in their communication. Um, and same with venues. I, ha I have, we've spoken to several venues and unique venues who are going through exactly the same as we are. And we have come together to discuss how best we can support one another. Um, previously, you wouldn't see that. Um, and I think COVID has taught us to, you know, connect. And again, it's that humility and, and humanitarian kind of element that actually we need to incorporate within our business to support one another. The whole point of hospitality is we are connecting people and we should, you know, we should sort of follow that principle. Actually, we need to connect within our, with our peers and our colleagues across the industry. So that's been crucial for us. And, and you know, whilst not running events, 
we still want to stay connected. And I think that's been really key. So do you foresee within the venues uh, a scenario where you have corporate events where you have either minimum or no attendees, but still using your venue space to host whatever it be, an awards or a conference or something. Is that something you think is going to happen? I think in terms of how venues are used in the future, I think it's important to look at the sector and the, and the client that is using it. So for corporates and the incentive market, incentive business is crucial for us. And, and as, as it is for London as a city, um, those incentives will again evolve where our venues are still used to experience the venue and the surroundings. But I think there will be, clients will be asking for, is there a hybrid option and what does that look like? And we have to be prepared to have a response to that in terms of products and content and suppliers that are able to deliver that. So I do think that there is the future in terms of the next two, possibly three years, people will be asking for a solution or an alternative. We are already in discussion, we're partnering with suppliers on solutions, um, whether that's our catering solution for a COVID safe event or whether it's hybrid. Um, and same with production and same with entertainment. We are exploring you know, how they are reacting to their hybrid requirements. Previously, where the venue would be the first thing clients are booking for the next six months, a year, it will be the production company and the venue to ensure that there is a deliverable for a hybrid solution. But I think people still want to be within iconic venues like ours um, and experience to an extent an event. I've seen, and I'm sure you have done too, the, you know, virtual animated events. And I was just wondering, obviously, you presumably want to fight that because <laughs> that doesn't require any venue. You know, venues, our biggest asset is our venues. Without a venue, we are, we are not a commercial entity. So it's a, it's a huge part of our message to say that we are still here and venues are still important. And yes, products like um, virtual venues are, can be seen as a threat or there's an opportunity there to work collaboratively with a venue to do a live event as well as host a hybrid solution in a virtual venue rather than a platform that is quite bland and bleak which people are sick of um, <laughs> for the past year offering a virtual venue solution in conjunction with a live venue like ours, I think is, could be quite appealing. I suppose what you would really like is a virtual animated version of, let's say, Banqueting House. Absolutely, so, and that's what I mean. I think it, the, the collaboration between utilising an asset, you know, versus, don't get me wrong, a hotel ballroom, are assets virtually to be mapped and recreated and take people within these venues that are not physically here is still an experience because these venues often people don't have the ability to visit them or experience an event in them. So actually it gives us the opportunity to broaden our audiences and reach. And what are you hopeful about personally? The thing that fills me with most confidence is that we are still receiving inquiries. There is still demand. Um, yes, that demand is not equivalent to what we were previously, but there is still demand. And that's what fills me with hope um, and our team with hope that we are still planning events and we are just waiting to open for when we can deliver those. And that's really promising. Clients are wanting to speak to us. Suppliers are planning you know, new, new things and, and new ventures. And we're planning new partnerships, which we're excited to launch for the end of the year, even next year if we must. But there is a still, there's a sense of moving forward. The pace has, has changed, but we are still moving forward.